I'm Kayla Koval, and I'm here to talk to you about business finances. Um, and I'm going to try to do it in a non-boring way. Um, Sometimes, you know, I can do what I can, you know. Um, I also um, just have to say, I unfortunately have a bit of a family emergency going on, so I might be a little speedy to try to get through this. Um, and forgive me if I, my voice is shaky or something, but we're going to do it. Um, and um, so, yeah, so let's get started. So, like I said, I am Kayla Coble. I'm owner of KPC Bookkeeping. Um, I am now um, Bookkeeper Launch certified, QuickBooks certified pro advisor certified, and zero certified advisor. Um, I'm in my third year of business and have two employees. Um, we work with um, women identified business owners only, mostly micro business owners and um, you know small micro business owners, solopreneurs, um, people usually in the first few years of their business um, because that's kind of who I like to serve. I like to be of service to the people who really need that guidance, especially in the first few years of their business when they're really just kind of babes lost in the woods about what to do with their bookkeeping. Um, as I said, I'm going to try to talk in plain terms. I am, as I said, going to speed through a little bit, but I will stop at certain points so you can ask questions, so don't worry about that. Um, and I'll also give you my contact information. My business cards are up at the top there, um, along with some freebie magnets if you want to take some home. Um, so you can always get in touch with me if there's something that I haven't answered. I want to make sure that you get your money's worth here. Um, but it is a shame-free environment. Any questions that you have are totally fine. Don't, you know, I'm all about, you know, some people are kind of in the middle of where their knowledge is. Some people really have, have never heard some of this terminology before. So please feel comfortable asking those questions. I won't make you feel stupid. <laughs> um, okay, so let's just talk about the agenda for today. Um, one thing, I'm going to start with transforming money mindset, which might seem like a weird um, thing for this particular course, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we're then going to talk about the first thing to do with your money as soon as you're spending or making money in your business. Um, I'm going to go through five mistakes to avoid when it comes to your bookkeeping. And then I'm going to walk you through a really simple step-by-step -step process to show you that it's you know, maybe not as scary as you think to do your own books. Um, okay, so money mindset. So why am I starting with money mindset? Um, you know, this is about bookkeeping, but it's really not just about bookkeeping. It's about business finances as a whole. And I think getting, and maybe you guys have, some of you have done some um, workshops already with that talked about this. Um, so it's not a huge piece, but I just wanted to um, mention it. Um, because there is one issue that I consistently see with all of my clients um, when I'm looking at their books, when I'm looking at what they're bringing in, and um, that is affecting their books because it's affecting, it's affecting their money, so it's affecting what we're seeing. Um, and that is people not charging enough, women especially not charging enough for their services. Um, so as, you, as we all know, I'm sure, in this room, women are only making at you know regular w2 jobs are only making 82 cents on the dollar women of color are making 63 cents on the dollar but there's actually been a recent study where a certain group of freelancers of creative freelancers females were only earning 53 cents on the dollar so <laughs> we're sort of treating ourselves a little worse than the employers that we escape from to start our own businesses so we don't want that that's no good um and I want to make sure, you know, there's a lot of reasons that we're doing that. It's not something I want to shame women for doing. It's really a whole bunch of societal cues. Um, when you think about um, the role models that women have that are wealthy women, we don't have a lot, you know, when it comes to what we grew up with and what we're seeing, what we see in the media. Women who are wealthy are often portrayed as mean, rude, entitled. Um, they treat their assistants poorly. They have bad personal relationships. The, the end of the movie is always they realize that they've been wrong and they need to give up all their money and, you know, whatever, work, have a bakery or something. Um, <laughs> which some of us, that is our dream, which is great. But um, it, it causes a lot. I mean, think about who we have. Like the ones that come to mind for me are Miranda Priestly from Double Wars Prada and Cruella DeVille, who 
literally wanted to kill puppies to make a coat. So <laughs> it's not exactly the best role models for us. And I think that, and there's just a lot of messaging. Women are supposed to be nurturing. They're not supposed to want money. It's greedy to want money. Um, I just don't think that any of those things are true, but we all have these limiting beliefs and these money stories, you know, that what we grew up with and what we were told about money. So I do, I was going to do kind of an exercise, but since we're kind of, I'm abbreviating a little bit, I'm going to have Miyako, if you don't mind to hand out some worksheets. Um, so these are, um, money affirmations. And what I would have you do, you can do it while I'm talking, if you get bored, if you want to, um, <laughs> But um, what I would have you do is I would read through these affirmations. Just read it, read them through slowly. Give yourself a second to let the words sink in. And in the ones that you felt like, yes, that felt good to say to myself, put a star. The ones that felt like, ooh, that was really scary and I didn't like saying that and it was icky, put an X. And then the ones with a star are the ones that I feel like you should start with because affirmations, we all know, we all know what affirmations are. I'm sure repeating things to yourself to help try to shift that limiting belief that you have. Um, so starting with the ones that already feel good and that already are feeling a little easy to you, I think is a good starting point and then work your way up. Like look at the ones that you put an X through and ask yourself why those felt gunky to you and I'm betting you there's a story behind that and that is what this, that's kind of your clue of like oh there's limiting beliefs here that I need to work on um there's a good book it's called pardon my French it's called get rich lucky bitch it is by um Denise Duffield Thomas and she talks about a process to do this to go through limiting beliefs and kind of try to shift them that I really um that I really like so that's just a recommendation um, so that is money mindset. Um, we just skipped, the, this is the exercise I just explained. Um, okay. So your very first step <coughs> when it comes to your money, after you get your money mindset right, of course, that's a little more practical, is separating your business and personal finances. And in case you can't tell by me having it up here three times, that is a very, very <laughs> important thing to do. We want you to separate your business and personal finances. And there is, there's reasons for that. Um, and let me just, so. okay, so the first one is just simply, it's just better organization for your bookkeeping. So if you're keeping track of your books um, manually, or in an accounting software, if every single thing is going in there, it's gonna take you a lot longer to filter out the things that you're, are your personal. I know that it's, especially when you're first starting, you're like, what's the point? I'm not making that much money. Just do it as soon as you possibly can because you're legally required to. <laughs> um, and, oh, and when you get to the point happily when you can hire somebody to do your books for you, um, the, the bookkeeper will be much happier to know that you're already doing this and understand that it's important. Um, the second and biggest reason I think is protecting your personal assets from your business liabilities and vice versa. So if any of you, do any of you have an entity for a business yet? Like an LLC, an S Corp, something like that. Okay, great. So, and I'll get to the people who don't, but still have a business in a second, but Part of the reason for that LLC is to, it's literally limited liability. So you're, um, if somebody sues you personally, they can't go after your business assets. And if they sue you um, and your business, they can't go after your personal assets. Same with like tax debts and, and things like that, any debt that you have. Um, if you are mingling, commingling your finances, if they're seeing that it's all going through one account, those protections pretty much get stripped away because there's no separation. You're not creating that separation. So you really want to um, have that entity and do that separation as soon as possible. Even if you don't have a business entity yet. So Vermont, it's pretty inexpensive and easy to set up an LLC. Um, I think it's like 135 bucks or something. Some states it's like 500 or $1,000 every year and it's kind of out of reach for somebody who's just started. Um, or if you just haven't gotten around to it. 
um, just open a separate personal account that everything runs through. So it doesn't have to be a business account. It's ideal if it is. But um, for a business account, you need the LLC and you need an, um, employ an EIN, a federal EIN. So um, if you don't have those things yet and don't want to get them yet, then just open a separate personal account. So that includes um, checking, savings, and credit cards. They should all have separate things that are just dedicated to your business. Um, Uncle Sam doesn't like commingling. Um, he doesn't like a lot of things, but <laughs> it's a red flag to them that you're not following proper protocols for managing your business, managing your finances, and it makes them want to dig deeper, which means audit, and nobody wants an audit. Um, and if you do get audited and they're seeing this, it's going to be a lot more complicated. And with the Inflation Reduction Act, They've hired a lot more IRS agents, a lot more likelihood that people are gonna get audited, even though it's technically for bigger companies. We all know how that works out. Um, so, okay, and just, and, and don't freak out. If you've had a business for several years and you've always used your personal checking account, um, just do it as soon as you can. And then going forward, you know, I still do that sometimes. I found out that I paid, <laughs> I paid somebody um, to do work at my house through my business checking account and had to fix that. But um, those are just don't make that the rule. You you can just record it. This is an owner's distribution, you know, is an accidental expense and you can pay yourself back or not. It, it depends. It's all up to you. Or you can pay the business back, whichever way you have done it. Um, OK, so before I move on to my next little section, are there questions about that? I was getting hired for a contract position and they asked me my salary requirements or what I what I was looking for and I gave them the number that my former husband was making as a consultant and they were like oh okay no problem and it was like three times what I was gonna ask for so that whole thing about like we don't charge enough <laughs> I don't do that I don't make that mistake anymore yeah because nobody's gonna say oh no that's not enough we're gonna pay you more like I mean really cool people would yeah, I guess because it was I wasn't aware enough of sort of what the industry standard was uh -huh. I was aware of what like my peers were doing yeah who were also all women, women. and undercharging so yes. And did you share with your women friends after that they yeah, needed to charge more? Really important as yeah. well as to like look around beyond sort of your own circle yeah. to see like what's happening, who's charging what. It, it's hard to get that information. It is hard because nobody wants to talk about it. And I think that you taking that and then telling your circle, this is what I'm charging is, you know, that can open up that conversation because we're also taught not to talk about money. So it makes it really tricky. But one, I mean, one rule of thumb I had, even when I was working for other people, I always asked for, I think it was like five to 10,000 more than I was offered. And then I'd always get probably about 5,000 more than I was offered. Because the worst they can say is no. But we're, we have this story that it's like, oh, but they'll think I'm greedy and they're not gonna like me anymore. And it's like, that's not really true. And if it is true, they suck. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so five mistakes to avoid with your bookkeeping, and don't worry, I'll give you a little solution to I'm a solution-oriented person. This sounds like it's very negative, but the first thing that I, the, the first mistake is putting off your bookkeeping. Um, I know it's tempting because not everybody is a nerd like me and likes spreadsheets and organization and checklists and rules and stuff like that. Um, but putting it off is just going to make the situation worse. You're going to forget things that happened months and months ago. You're not going to, re you know, remember what this charge is for, and it's going to take you forever to pull your receipts together. So I really recommend scheduling it as an appointment on your calendar. So you've probably heard the, the um, you know, for exercise, if you don't like exercise, like put it on your appointment, put it on your appointment calendar and make it almost like it's a doctor's appointment and it's non-negotiable. Um, now, obviously things happen and you're not gonna like, if your kid has 
something at school and you're like, no, I said I was doing my books that day. But at least it's on your calendar so that you know you have to move that somewhere else. You don't get to cancel it. You can move it, but you can't cancel it. Um, I think that it just creates consistency and doing it on a regular basis um, and how often kind of depends on your volumes. If you only have, you know, you're, you're spending, um, you're making like 30 transactions a month, like you can just do it monthly. Um, if it's more often, if you're like a retail store and you're making hundreds of sales and receipts are going through all the time, then I would do it on a weekly basis. Whatever's gonna make it take like an hour or like a couple hours or less, cause you don't want it to end up taking a whole day, which is how a lot of people who don't do anything until tax time, which may be some of you and that is fine, um, when they, it ends up, I, I hear that all the time, it takes me all day or it took me all weekend because they hadn't done it. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you just knocked that out in little chunks over the course of the year? Um, the second mistake is not writing down what you're doing and how. Um, instead, I really recommend documenting everything that you're doing, including like, I need to pull this report and I need to go to this menu and click this and this and this. It makes it so much easier for when you're going back to do it again, you're not having to reinvent the wheel and be like, wait, what do I have to do again? So um, my business cards are in the back. There's a little QR code on the bottom of the card um, that if you put your phone up to it and hit the link, um, you just have to find the free bookkeeping checklist and you put in your email and it'll email it to you and then you can print it out at home. Um, I recommend like just writing all over it and then maybe creating your own um, because all businesses are a little different and you don't you won't have to do everything that's on that list and there are some things that aren't on the list that you would have to do. But um, definitely write notes everywhere and keep it so that when you're sitting down to do your books, you have that right there, you know exactly what you're doing and it almost becomes um, not mindless, but just a lot less challenging. Um, the third mistake, this is my favorite one to talk about, so I'm gonna take a little drink first. The I've third. Made all the mistakes so far, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Oh, thank you. That's okay. This well, and that's why I do it because it's the most common ones I see. So you're, we're all in the same boat. Well, I'm not, but <laughs> but it's my job. So um, so the third common mistake is not paying yourself. So thirty percent. Hold on, let me get to where in my notes. Have it. Yeah, 30% of small business owners don't take a salary. And I don't have my statistics about the failure business failure rates, but I have to believe that they are linked because if you are consistently not paying yourself, how are you living? We don't have, a lot of us don't have like trust funds to fall back on or venture capitalists or anything like that. So if you're not able to actually live your life and you're in under constant stress, to that, oh, maybe I'm not paying my taxes or I'm, you know, I'm not getting paid, but where's all my money going? Um, very stressful and not sustainable. So I recommend a bucket system. Um, it's developed actually, um, well, there's a lot of different systems out there that are like this. I call mine the better business bucket system, but I feel weird saying it. So, um, <laughs> but it was loosely based on a book called Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Um, and the principles are basically that you have four accounts. Um, one of them is your personal checking account. So you really only have three business accounts. Um, so you've got your personal checking, that's where you pay yourself. So all the, but all the money that comes in for your business goes into your business checking. You pay yourself into your personal checking, a percentage. You keep a percentage in your business checking for operating expenses. And then you have two savings accounts. One of them is just for saving for taxes. And the other one is for your bonus, which is the fun account. So um, the bonus account is just that. So the, the idea of it is that you're taking a tiny percentage, 5%, maybe even 1% if you're really, you know, your profit are really slim, profit margins are really slim. Um, and you siphon off a little bit of that 
and you let it build up and you let it build up and every three to 12 months you take a distribution from it and you do something for yourself it's not for your business it's not an extra um you know business expense it's for you personally so think of it think of it as like the big ceos of the fortune 500 companies and their bonus is like a yacht well, maybe you're not buying yourself a yacht, but you're getting yourself a pedicure or you're going on a little long weekend or you're going out to a nice dinner or, you know, even if you're donating something to a cause that you feel good about. Um, I think it's a really good way to sustain that money mindset of, you know, it's not too scarce. I deserve a treat. Being a business owner is hard. Um, there's so much that goes into it. We're thinking about our businesses 24 hours a day. And if we don't have things that make that worth it, then it's just not sustainable. So that's what the bonus account is for. Question. Yeah. Just how to start doing that. Do you just like, if you get a big check coming in, you just start there? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, some, so for some people who have been in business and are kind of working off the model of, I take whatever's left over, which most people do. It's just a new way of looking at how you could be doing it differently. So it's kind of sitting down and looking at your expenses, looking at your total income. And I'll talk about expenses and taxes in a second too. Um, kind of doing your own numbers and figuring out what percentage am I spending on that? Am I saving anything for savings? And then try to make a plan of how to like incrementally start moving towards that. So. These ideal percentages that I have here are really, I wouldn't say they're arbitrary, but they're kind of like a, a, an in an ideal world, this is what you would be doing. You'd be paying yourself 50%. You would be spending 15 to 30% on your operating expenses, but no more than 30% of your total income. And then the flip flop of that would be what you were saving for taxes. So if you are, um, if you're looking at your expenses and you're like, oh, that's about 15% of what I'm actually taking in, then I need to be saving more for taxes because I have less that I can deduct. So my tax liability is gonna be higher. So it's kind of a seesaw. Um, the more you spend, the less your tax liability is, but not that that means that your expenses are free money from the government. It just means your total liability is lower. Um, and the less you, and the more, yeah, so the more you spend, the more you can deduct, the less you spend, the less you can deduct. So the more you spend, the less you have to save for taxes, and the less you spend, the more you have to pay for taxes. So it's kind of finding where in there you're already spending, or if you're brand new and you're, you know, this is, you're really, really new and you're able to use this from scratch, which is ideal, um, then you can build your budget around kind of what you expect to be receiving. Um, especially if it's a side hustle, this is a great system because you can just look at what you brought in last month and divide it up accordingly and then build your budgets and stuff around that. So I know this is actually kind of, it's not super complicated, but I know there's a lot of questions usually that come up about this. So I'm going to stop here for now. No? Cool. Okay. Um, so the fourth mistake that I'm seeing is not creating a budget at all. Now, a lot of people don't like the word budget. It's a dirty word. It makes them feel gross. It makes them feel limited and, you know, all the bad things. Um, so, but it's really important. And it's important, especially if you're going to use the bucket system that you are budgeting so that you know you're not going over a certain point. Um, if you like, you could think of it as a spending plan. I know that's just a little tweak of words, but I think of it like that. I like making budgets because I'm not thinking about all the things that I can't pay for. I'm thinking about all the things I'm saying yes to, which actually my friend Michelle Lucas, who's a financial coach, she calls it a yes plan. So it's all the things, what am I saying yes to? What am I saying I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna spend this on advertising because I think it's gonna bring my business a better place. Yes, I'm gonna hire a bookkeeper. Um, you know, yes, I'm going to pay for these software and apps that are going to make my business so much more successful. So definitely creating a budget is, um, is something important that you need to do and reevaluate on an ongoing basis. And the fifth mistake is just thinking of it like a chore. So I already said this isn't everybody's favorite, um, favorite activity. Bookkeeping is not for everyone. Not everyone's a nerd. Um, 
but if you think of it, usually if you're thinking of it like a chore, you're gonna put it off, which we already said was bad. Um, so think of it almost, what I recommend actually is to find a way, find a way to make it fun. So associating something positive with something that you really don't wanna do can really help it be a little better. So for me, when I'm doing my personal finances, like paying the bills and all of that stuff, I have a glass of wine. I have some popcorn, I put on General Hospital, my guilty pleasure show in the background. And because I have a list of what I have to do, it's not super, um, it's not super taking up too much of my mental capacity. So I can actually like enjoy that moment where I'm not working on anything else. I'm just doing that and kind of appreciating like, I am lucky that I am able to pay this bill. Um, so just associating something, associating it with something fun, making it me time, making it time that, you know, maybe you're telling people don't distract me, I wanna get this done. You blast a playlist, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so those were the five biggest mistakes. Any questions on that before I go through the process? Okay. All right. So step-by-step -step process. So reminder before this to use a checklist, use my checklist, use your own, do a spreadsheet, do a Word doc, do it in Asana or some um, project management software, whatever floats your boat. Um, but the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is get all your receipts together. Now, you may not know this, but for every Trans every amount you spend, and I think it's over, I think it's over $75. I'm sorry, I'm not remembering. For me, I just keep a receipt for every single transaction, so I don't remember the limit, but everyone's like, every transaction. Um, you need a backup for everything, and your credit card statement or bank statement does not count as that backup, because what it doesn't do is say what you purchased. So you could have 50 Amazon charges, and Three of them could be boots and pillows and whatever. Um, so you need a receipt because in case of audit, they're gonna need a, to see a receipt and see proof that what you bought was actually relevant to your business. And if not, they, they're like, well, you counted that as a deduction and you weren't supposed to and now you owe us money and you owe penalties. So that's why we keep receipts. Um, if you are in an accounting software already, um, which you don't have to be at this point if you're, um, if you're really starting out, you might not need that yet. Um, but if you are in an accounting software, you can use, most accounting softwares now have an app, you can snap the receipt, categorize it, it goes right into the transaction, and then you can get rid of that receipt because you have it all in one place. Um, if you, you also have the option if you're in a spreadsheet to like scan them and just keep them in a folder. I also have an email folder because a lot of, a lot of things we purchase are online, and I keep it there just in case. Um, so you want to start with that. You also will use those if you're not if you don't have an accounting software that like has your bank feed hooked up, like your bank hooked into the software. Um, if you don't have that, then you can use the receipts to enter them into like your spreadsheet um, and make sure that you're keeping track of everything you're spending because if you're not then you're not you're missing out on money that you could have deducted from what you owe in taxes or money you could get as a refund um, so basically and and once you're doing that you're wanting to put them into categories I recommend taking a look at a, at a schedule C um, which is the form that you file if you're an LLC if you're um, or sole proprietor um, you form, you file the Schedule C, and it has the categories basically that they want: advertising and marketing, um, contracted labor, cost of goods sold, all of those things. So I would take a look at one of those and build your categories, whether it's in a spreadsheet or accounting software or whatever you're using. Build them off of that sheet because then it's going to be way easier if you do your own taxes, or if you hire somebody to do your taxes for you. Um, which I do, I don't actually do taxes for my clients, um, then you already have them in the categories. It's gonna be way easier. So I would look at that as kind of your model. And you can always have extra categories that are that you know will probably feed into 
something else, but you want to see it separately. I saw a hand. Um, so this is a great lesson in just like, this is, it's all about organization and being consistent, right? It is. I guess, can you talk about when you're selecting line items, um, uh, the tension between looking good for your taxes, which is trying to show that you have no money, so you don't have to pay any taxes, <laughs> and, or, and um, using your numbers for strategic purposes in your business, and maybe yeah. even selling or bringing someone in. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, that's a good point. I think it's really important when you are setting up your books that you do see the information that you want to see. Um, and I do that for my clients. I kind of have to walk that line between this is what's going to make it easy. But you can also always know that whatever category you create, um, say you want to um, say you want to see a whole category for Facebook ads because you want to see how those are, you know comparing that to your gross income is it making a difference in what I'm bringing in? You can absolutely do that. You just have to know that you're going to map that into the advertising in this in the um, schedule C so I think that it really is about how how you want to see things I do encourage people not to pick put too many categories because I think it can get very confusing to look at and um, it just becomes a lot more work but does that answer your question yeah. kind of? okay great um, so once all of your expenses are in you've categorized them you do want to reconcile your accounts now what does that mean? It's sort of like balancing your checkbook, which nobody really does anymore. Does anyone in this room balance their checkbook? <laughs> Besides me. <laughs> you do? Yay! You! Good job. I should have brought candy bars or something. Um, but um, it is important to reconcile your accounts. And what that really means is basically you're comparing your bank statement to whatever you have, it, whether it's your accounting software or your, or your spreadsheet. You are going through line by line and saying, yep, I have that one, yep, I have that one, yep, I have that one. Um, and that the balances at the end of the month match. Now in like QuickBooks Online, they have a reconcile screen and you enter your ending balance and the date that it ends. And then it brings up all the transactions that it, ha that it has that it's showing for you. And then you can just click and click and click and then it'll show you if the balance is off and then you kind of have to figure out why. Um, there are many reasons that this is important. Um, Basically, it's for accuracy because you really want to make sure that you have the money that you're supposed to have. So I was reconciling my account and realized that I had entered a sales receipt in QuickBooks and had charged like an ACH, so it should have come right out. And I didn't think anything of it because I'd already put it through. And then when I was reconciling, I realized, oh, that, that charge never went through, so I never got that money. And if I hadn't been reconciling, I wouldn't have caught that. I would have missed out on like $1,000. Um, so get your money and you also want to make sure that you don't have duplicates because then if you're if you're saying that you had twice as many expenses as you had that's a no-no that's lying to the government we don't want that um, so you don't want to miss out on money and you don't want to miss out on deductions either if there's something that isn't in there that you thought you had um, okay so after you've done all of this work all of kind of the the categorizing and the reconciling, you're going to want to run a couple reports. Um, and if I had a lot of time, I would show you sample um, balance sheets and, and profit and losses. But basically, your balance sheet, that's going to be something that's a little harder for you to do outside of an accounting software, um, unless you're really nerdy and you really want to build your own balance sheet and plug numbers in each time you do your books. Um, but basically your balance sheet shows your assets, so everything you own, including your bank accounts, your inventory, um, any equipment that you have, um, depending on the accounting method you use. It could be your accounts receivable, any invoices that are outstanding that you know are due to you. Um, all of those are assets. You also have your liabilities, which is what you owe, credit cards, loans, lines of credit. Um, gift cards outstanding is actually a liability account sales tax payable, the things that you owe out, um, and then your equity, which is basically shows what the value of your company is. So it's important to look at this sheet um, really to make sure that everything's correct, to be aware of what your balances are and what you owe. Um, it, it can help you make decisions about, okay, I really need to pay this debt down because right now 
I don't have enough assets to cover all my debts and that's not going to look good for a bank or investors. Um, you know, I need to bring in more money or I need to spend, spend less so that I have more in my bank accounts. Um, it can help you make all those decisions. And that's what also, like I said, banks are going to want to look at that if they're thinking about giving you a loan and investors are going to want to look at that before they invest in your company. Um, so that is the balance sheet. Once a month, I would say. I mean, just taking a quick look at it. Um, with yes. A yeah, I would say whenever I would kind of just pick what whatever frequency you're doing. But I don't think you need even if you're doing weekly to like categorize your transactions. I don't think you also need to. Re you don't need to reconcile it weekly. Um, monthly is best, and running a report once a month I think is good. And you don't have to go super deep dive but just take a look at it make sure everything looks right um, you know it can also show you your outstanding bills if you're running your bills in there and showing your outstanding invoices that people owe you so you know what you can what you can um, what you should follow up on to get your money back um, those are all things that it can help you do so just get kind of getting practice looking at it is a good thing to do um, and then the next report, which is the one everyone is probably more familiar with, is the profit and loss, which is also called the income statement. Um, that one's a little easier to interpret because it's just your income is at the top and your expenses, then your expenses come and at the bottom is your net income or your profit. So that's showing you how much money you're making, really. It's showing you what you're taking in. Um, if you're in QuickBooks, there's actually a report called um, expenses or profit as percentage of total income or something, look for the percentage sign um, and that'll lead you to it. But um, that shows you what percentage of your total income are you spending on things, which can be really helpful because you can see, well, I'm spending 70% um, of my total income on the merchandise that I'm selling. And then you're like, well, that's not very a very big profit margin. I might need to raise my prices. So it can tell you that. It can tell you um, I'm spending all this money on advertising, but n my numbers are not going up. So that's telling you maybe the advertising isn't working, um, or maybe it just needs to be shifted to a different you know audience or something. Um, and yeah, and then that gives you your profit. Your profit or net income is also your tax liability. So that's not telling you you know say you made a thousand dollars and then you spent five hundred dollars on expenses your profit is five hundred dollars that's not saying you owe five hundred to the government for taxes that's saying that that's the number that they're going to base what you owe on so your tax bracket might be 25 percent so five hundred dollars 25% of $500 is 125. So it's a quick way to kind of get an idea of how much you're going to, how much you might owe based on kind of prior years. Um, yeah, any questions on those? Okay. Um, all right, we are cooking right along. So um, that's really, the bulk of my presentation before I, I'll have room for extra questions that have nothing to do you know with my slides you can ask any other questions that you have about bookkeeping um, I did just want to mention that I do have a full course that goes way in depth about all these things and shows you how to read your profit and loss and balance sheet it shows you all these kinds of things talking about business entities and tax liability and what you can deduct. It comes with a ton of like handouts and extras. It has bucket system calculator and all that stuff. Um, I don't want to push it too hard, but um, that's kind of what you can expect from that course. It is normally $4.97, but I'm feeling generous. <laughs> and um, if you use the coupon code um, at the bottom there, the WEOC250, um, you can get it for $247. Um, and it's a self-paced course. You just go online and you do the videos that you want to do at your own pace. Um, and that's it for that. Thank you for enduring my speedy talk. <laughs> um, what questions is, do people have? It could have nothing to do with anything that I've said so far. <laughs> yeah. Um, questions about paying yourself. Yeah. Like, so do you 
you see more people do just kind of like that amount that maybe you've made that you're going to take for yourself versus like a regular amount? I see all different kinds of things. Um, I think what some people do is they kind of work with these percentages and then they say, well, that's probably around, you know, $1,500 or $3,000 a month. And they just regularly draw that from their account rather than going down to like the dollars and cents. Um, and then I see people that actually use like the calculator that I, that I give them and they actually plug in what they made and distribute it that way. Um, and then of course, if you're on S Corp, you can pay yourself on payroll and that's obviously, well, usually a, a set number. So it so kind of runs all over the board. Your, like, so in the first scenario, like, so it's like an LLC, um, <coughs> sole owner, but if it, so then are you showing that as, it's not really an expense then, is it? Or are no. you showing separately as an owner's draw? It's an owner's draw, yeah. It's, unless you're an S Corp and paying yourself on payroll, your wages are not tax deductible. So if you pay yourself zero or you pay yourself, you know, everything your company makes, the government doesn't care. It's based on the prop, your profit. On the profit, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And under the S corp scenario, um, you're paying yourself a salary, but you also can take owner distribution. Yes, you so can do both. Yep, you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary, um, and the benefit of that also is that you're paying into taxes, so you don't have to save as much. You're saving um, unemployment tax as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a few. So I work exclusively in QuickBooks because I just want everything to be consistent for my clients. Um, and it has about 85% of the market share. So it's a good one to get on if you know that eventually you're, you'll hire a bookkeeper because a lot of bookkeepers already well, work in it. I was it. gonna say, I'm on it already trying to do it myself and it, it's, it's not as uh, It's not friendly, as user friendly. user friendly as I thought. Yeah, there's also, um, so there's a, a program called Zero. it's spelled with an X. Um, that's about half the price of QuickBooks. Um, and I've heard from people that they find that a little more intuitive. There's also Wave, which is free. So if you're really just starting out and you don't need, um, you don't need as much functionality and reporting and stuff, and you just really want to keep track of your income and expenses, um, Wave is a good option to start. Yeah. Yeah. Bernie, um, I tried to sign up for Wave, um, but I'm a counselor and it said it's not into compliance. So I've had oh. to find yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know any, I don't know anything about that. If I hear though, I will, you can email me and I'll research it for you. <laughs> if you switch accounting softwares, you have all your receipts saved in one, how does that work? Well, that's the bummer, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I do. My, because I'm using QuickBooks, then I'm like, oh, it is expensive, and I was like thinking about others, but I'll probably just stay on QuickBooks, but then I was like, oh, I have a folder, Every yeah, you I can. Backup, but I was thinking, like, oh, all my receipts are in there. So it does give you. I mean, as long as you have the receipts, you don't have to have them directly in your software. It does make it a much cleaner process mm -hmm. because you can go right to it. But as long as you're naming your receipts, you know, give it the date and the vendor and maybe even the amount, it does make it easier. You can just do that. You don't have to repeat the process of uploading them if you don't want to. And then you can just do that in your new one. One other thing I'll say about QuickBooks is a lot of the times they try to sell you on like the $85 a month plan and you probably don't need that. There's a simple start plan that's $30 a month. Um, that's a lot more affordable and it has a little less functionality but not always functionality that you need, especially right away. I'm using zero and I like it. You like zero? I really It really. It really is. I know, I feel a little bad being a part of it, but it just makes it easier. That's what I learned on, so. But Xero, um, also, they kind of help you reconcile as you go along, so. Um, Their little upload app is great. Well, it's in your face of Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't used it, but um, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, what about the difference between QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks, the desktop version? So desktop is eventually, they're gonna try to make it go away. Okay. Um, so I would just go online and they are starting, I think they've now started with desktop, you have to pay annually anyway. It's not like just a one and done. So I feel like you might as well be online. 
I've had like an accountant pre like prefer the desktop version. Yes, like I think it's whatever version. you learn on, that's yeah, what you yeah. want to okay. stick with. Um, I learned on online, so I'm like, everybody should be online. I but it's really online. personal preference. I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't like the way it kind of looked and the screens were all over the place. I couldn't find things, so it's all personal. Anything else? Okay. Well, my contact information is on there. If there's any questions that you like, just didn't want to ask in front of people, um, or we didn't get to, then please feel free to email me. Um, my website is kpcbookkeeping.com. Again, if you have my business card and you are interested in working with me, there's um, the QR code has a discovery call. You can sign up. It'll ask you some questions. Um, and on Instagram, I'm bookkeeper Kayla. Um, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all so much.